Uh, for those of you that may not know me, my name is Yanis uh, Sturaitis and I'm a lecturer in Byzantine history at the University of Edinburgh. And today I have the pleasure and the honor to uh, be chairing uh, this session uh, on uh, James Howard Johnston's new book on the last uh, uh, great uh, war of late antiquity. Um, uh, I guess I believe uh, James is uh, a scholar that needs actually very little introduction, uh, but nonetheless, I'm going to introduce him uh, very shortly. So you'll know he uh, was a university lecturer in Byzantine studies and fellow of uh, Corpus Christi College at the University of Oxford from 1971 to 2009. Uh, he has definitely served the University of Oxford uh, very well uh, with a number of um, pupils that have become uh, important scholars. Uh, so uh, he has, of course, published a lot of important uh, books and articles. Just let me mention his first book, The Scholar and the Gypsy, together uh, with Nigel Ryan in, uh, back in 1992. Of course, the uh, very, very useful translation of the Armenian history attributed to Sibelius. Uh, in 1999, jointly with Robert Thompson, a very useful book for all of us Byzantinists who need uh, some um, access to non-Greek sources. Uh, Israel, Sasanian Persia and the End of Antiquity uh, was published in 2006. And of course, uh, his large uh, Magnus Opus, his latest, I'm sorry, Magnus Opus, uh, Witnesses to the World Crisis, uh, which was published in 2010, kind of a prequel of uh, the book uh, that we uh, that he's going to present today. So um, I don't want to take much of your time. I, I want to uh, leave time for uh, James to tell us a lot about his book. I'm just going to say a few things. Uh, looking through the book, uh, it's uh, first first of all, uh, this was definitely a desideratum, uh, a book. Um, focusing on the last great war of late antiquity. Uh, we, didn't had a, we didn't have a study like that uh, so far. Of course, there was, uh, there's a book of uh, Walter Kegi, uh, but this is not a book about the war, it's a book about Heraclius. So I think uh, James definitely makes a significant, a significant contribution to uh, 7th century scholarship. It's gonna be a very uh, important contribution, a very useful book for scholars of the 7th century. Uh, extraordinarily uh, good work with a large range of sources, uh, especially non-Byzantine sources. Probably a few can claim that they know the non-Byzantine sources of this period better than uh, James Howard Johnston. Uh, if one goes through the chapters of the book, it becomes evident that this is an exhaustive study of the war, and this is, makes it very, very useful. Um, from my own point of view, as someone who um, teaches courses on the seventh century, I see there a book that is gonna, it's going to go into the classroom, uh, used a lot by uh, both undergraduate and postgraduate students. So on the whole, I believe that we are dealing here with, um, with a great project. And I will now uh, leave the floor to James and uh, invite him to tell us more about uh, this uh, fascinating study. Uh, before we go over to James, uh, just to remind you, please uh, mute your microphones and uh, please feel free to write your questions in the chat sec section uh, during uh, James's presentation so we can start with questions immediately after he uh, stops. So I'm gonna mute my microphone now and James, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, you can hear me, I hope. Good. Uh, now, Yanis, uh, you have flattered me with this reference to the uh, uh, non-Greek uh, and non-Latin sources. Uh, I, I did some emergency uh, study of uh, Arabic, Ethiopic, and Syriac. For the, sake, for the sake of this book. Uh, the only one of the non-Byzantine languages that I can be said to know reasonably well is Armenian. Uh, second preliminary remark is that um, this project has taken even longer than the addition of the day ceremonies. I think it started life as a handout to undergraduate pupils at Oxford 
in the uh, early 1980s. So in fact, it's a pretty pathetic uh, product of uh, uh, something under 40 years uh, of work. Uh, but but to, uh, to the book, um, uh, and by the way, Yanis, you will have to cut me short, as I told you when we talked before, if I'm going uh, over the limit, uh, in a more just, firmer manner than Vincent Terroche. <laughs> if, if you could just uh, try to uh, stabilize your laptop because your screen is moving all the time. So for oh, I'm reason. sorry, it's my knees. Uh, all right. I, I'm gesticulating okay. with my legs. I'm okay. sorry. Um, uh, right, so the book, you see, I'm sitting on a sofa, all relaxed in the, in the sitting room of our little house in Brighton. Right, so The Last Great War of Antiquity uh, is basically an old-fashioned uh, narrative history. Now, narrative, I would say, is old-fashioned, but uh, it is uh, the very essence of history. And in this particular uh, tale, there is plenty of drama to hold the attention of the reader. It's like watching a murder in slow motion. Uh, the body, in this case, the Roman Empire, is slowly battered into a submission. This is the first 10 years of attritional, uh, first eight years of attritional warfare uh, by the uh, Persians, uh, uh, lasting from spring 603 uh, to uh, summer uh, 610. Then there is a stage basically of violent uh, kicking. And uh, so, uh, um, uh, this is the stage of uh, swift conquest of most of the East Roman Empire, of uh, northern uh, uh, of, uh, Syria, Northern Palestine, Palestine and Egypt uh, from um, late uh, autumn 610 through to 621. And then we come to the sudden revival, resuscitation of the semi-corpse, which was the East Roman Empire in the years 622 to 628. The almost miraculous uh, campaigns of Heraclius who took the war uh, to the enemy, to enemy to Persian territory. And in those uh, six years transformed uh, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the war into one in which uh, a single fatal thrust from uh, 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 Transcaucasia, uh, from the region of, of Lake Urumiya, south into what is now Iraq, then to threaten uh, the uh, Sasanian capital, triggered a putsch which deposed uh, Heraclius's great antagonist, uh, the greatest of all uh, Sasanian uh, war uh, leaders, Khosrow II of Parvaz. Now, uh, the book, no, not the book, the subject, is of more than passing importance. It is in effect the last act in the history of the ancient world at the west end of Eurasia. Now, what I try to do in the book is to intersperse narrative with explanation, of course, and also with a certain amount of analysis of the structure, social, economic, uh, institutional involved. Uh, so this is just to draw the attention of uh, future readers uh, to, um, uh, in particular, to two uh, to two parts of the book. In chapter two, on what I call the Heraclean Revolution, that is the political movement with ga which gathered pace uh, in uh, Africa, North Africa, uh, in the Middle East, in the Levant, and led eventually to the seizure of power by Heraclius in uh, autumn uh, 610. Uh, in the course of that chapter, I introduce a certain amount of analysis of uh, cities, of uh, urban disorder, of the role of the factions. And then on a much larger scale, in chapter five, I take the opportunity of that uh, moment between 
the succession of uh, Persian victories uh, up to their occupation and the consolidation of their control over Egypt in uh, 619 to 21. After that, and before the Byzantine, the, sorry, the Roman revival, I should just add that I firmly use the terminology of Roman for anything to do with the empire before the rise of the Arabs. Uh, but I, I take the opportunity of the, this to pause and to look around the world which was engaged in the war. So first at the Roman Empire, so more analysis of structures uh, and of the adaptation to the demands of war. Second at the Middle East under Persian occupation and then third at the Sasanian Empire at this moment of its triumph. Now the book ends uh, with some a chapter of uh, uh, looking at explanations and uh, consequences. Now, of course, there was some. There had. To, there has to be explanation for uh, Persian success, but that's not a difficult task uh, because uh, the um, uh, basically the political ructions in the East Roman Empire, uh, that is, uh, Phocas's uh, rebellion and seizure of power in uh, at the very beginning of November. Uh, 602, and then the whole Heraclean revolution from 608 to 610 uh, uh, disturbed, uh, uh, disrupted uh, the structures of the East Roman Empire and provided opportunities which were ruthlessly exploited. And the second key explanation for that is that the, when the Persian armies, after the phase of attrition, broke through the inner line of Roman defense on the Euphrates and swiftly reached the coast of the Mediterranean, they did in effect divide the East Roman Empire in two and thus gained an enormous advantage of inner lines. That is, they could move their troops between the Northern, that is Asia Minor frontier and the Southern uh, Palestinian Egyptian frontier far quicker than the Romans could move troops by sea. Uh, but the harder task is to explain uh, uh, how on earth, how on earth, uh, Heraclius and the Romans uh, uh, revived uh, and were in the position to launch uh, counter strikes in the 620s. And uh, here, uh, the, the, exp the explanations are more numerous. And you know the task is harder, but in effect, one uh, can see uh, the reduced Roman Empire producing an armed force which was small, well trained, had extraordinary stamina, uh, and uh, was able uh, well and had advantages of strategic mobility and tactical flexibility over their Persian opponents, so that they were able to defeat the enemy in detail. Now, in effect, we've got something akin to the Roman Republic, uh, the legions of the Roman Republic emerging in this late stage in the 20,000 or so, 15 to 20,000 or so men accompanying Heraclius. Save that uh, and now in the seventh century, the emphasis was on cavalry. Uh, secondly, there was uh, uh, um, the generalship of Heraclius, uh, about which I bang on a bit. Um, uh, thirdly, the introduction of religious enthusiasm into the armed forces and the, uh, the, the Roman body politic at large. And in particular, the notion that martyrdom could, you, uh, could lead, martyrdom in battle, could death in battle was martyrdom and martyrdom would lead to heavenly rewards. Strangely, a view first articulated by Heraclius in the very year that Muhammad first articulated it uh, to uh, his followers in Medina. And uh, finally, and probably most important, the intervention of the third great power, which had emerged in the middle of the sixth century, that of the Turkish Khaganate in this war in Western Eurasia. And um, I go on, I end with some uh, consequences um, uh, of which I suppose the most important 
was the injection or the re uh, 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 um, the strengthening of the apocalyptic fears which were already present in the mind of the prophet Muhammad and which were suffusing his early utterances. So I think with that, I leave it. <laughs>